Praise be Jesus and Mary. I'm David Rodriguez, Content Director of the Fatima Center, and we're building on a firm foundation as we study the basics of our Catholic faith. In the previous episode, we began to consider the most blessed trinity, the greatest mystery, the central mystery of the Christian faith. Today we'll continue that reflection looking at how the blessed trinity is present in the source and summit of our Christian life, that is, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We'll begin with a prayer, and we'll pray the Creed in Latin. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Credo in Deum Patrem Omnipotentem, Creatorem Celi et Terre, et in Jesum Christum, Filium Eius Unicum Dominum Nostrum, Qui conceptus est Spiritus Sancto, natus ex Maria Virgine, passus su Pontio Pilato, crucifixius mortuos et sepultus, descendit ad inferos, tertia die resurrexit a mortuis, ascendit a celos, sedet ad dextram Dei Patris omnipotentis, inde venturus est judicare vivos et mortuos. Credo in Spiritum Sanctum, Sanctam Ecclesiam Catholicam, Sanctorum Communionem, Remissionem peccatorum, carnis resurrectionem, et vitam eternam. Amen. Sancte Toma, ora pro nobis. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. As we mentioned last time, and as most of us learned through our basic catechism, for example, the Baltimore Catechism when you are young, there is only one God in three divine persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We look to our infallible sources of dogma for this teaching. For example, sacred scripture. We did some of that last time, but also sacred tradition. And people often ask, well, what are the contents of sacred tradition? How do you know what fits into that category? Certainly the creeds are there which is why we also looked at the Athanasian Creed, the ecumenical councils in their infallible teachings, those anathema statements, but also the ordinary and universal teaching of the magisterium. We could say the perennial teaching of the magisterium. What Holy Mother Church has always and everywhere consistently taught from you know, the church fathers to the church doctors through saints, through popes, to the moral theologians, etc., and then we can also look at the extraordinary power of the Pope when he speaks ex cathedra infallibly. But perhaps the most normal, most common, and most important way to transmit sacred tradition is through the sacred liturgy. For example, the Holy Mass and the sacraments. That's what we'll look at right now. There's a very important ancient principle comes back from certainly the 4th, 5th century, and in Latin it is lex orandi, lex credendi. I'd encourage all of you to memorize that. You know, say it a few times so it rolls off your tongue. Lex orandi, lex credendi. What does this mean? Lex is Latin for law. We could also say the rule or the norm. Orandi is to pray. You can think in Latin when the priest says oremus, right? It's that same word, orar. And then, um, credendi is belief, the belief. So you can think of credo, I believe. So what we're basically saying is that the law of prayer, or the law of worship, is also the law of belief, or the law of faith. In other words, we are going to believe according to how we worship. Our beliefs, our dogma, our doctrine, will be shaped by the manner in which we pray and worship. It will be affected by it. And similarly, we are going to pray and worship in a way that is consistent with what we believe. Simply put, no hypocrisy here. Pray according to your belief and believe in the manner that you pray. It's, it's pretty simple, Lex Orandi Des Cereni, but a very foundational principle. If you recall, last time we talked about how the term Blessed Trinity is actually not found in the sacred scripture. 
And yet we have this wonderful Athanasian Creed that very specifically lays out our belief very precisely what we believe about the Trinity. Uh, when the Arians, that heresy, attacked the divinity of Jesus Christ and tried to use scriptural passages such as uh, the Father is greater than I to show that our Lord Jesus Christ and the Father are not equal, one of the main ways that the Orthodox Catholics were able to respond with the true Catholic faith is by looking to the liturgy. And they said, well, in the liturgy, we have always worshipped Jesus Christ as divine, as equal to the Father. And so we know this is the rule of faith because it's the rule of our worship. So that is a very powerful principle, lex orandi, lex credendi, and we can use it to see how there is this tremendous Trinitarian structure to the liturgy. You see very clearly the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, all three persons of the Blessed Trinity, and yet there being only one God. Uh, very briefly, this Trinitarian structure, for example, is found in the sign of the cross. We begin uh, the Mass, we begin all our prayers with that sign of the cross, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we say, in the name of. We do not say in the names, plural, but in the name, singular. So there you see also the one God, but the three persons. In the Gloria, uh, that's a great prayer of adoration. We got it from the angels, right, on Christmas Day when they came to the shepherds to announce this great joy. But that has a very Trinitarian structure, as does the Glory Be. We say Glory Be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, that Gloria Patri, which again in the liturgy is prayed numerous times. Uh, unfortunately, if I'm not mistaken, in the new Mass, it's been completely excised, cut out. So when one attends the new Mass, that great prayer of glory to the Trinitarian God, the glory be to the Father, is not even prayed. Uh, in the traditional rite, it must be prayed at least three times, if not more. Same thing with the Kyrie, when we beg God for mercy from our sins. There are three Kyrie eleisons, Lord have mercy, directed to the Father. And then we have three Christe eleisons that are directed to the Son. And then we have three more Kyrie eleisons that are directed to God the Holy Ghost. Can you see the Trinitarian structure? In the Offertory, there is a great prayer, there is a great prayer to the Blessed Trinity. Look it up in your missals as well as throughout the Roman canon. It has that Trinitarian structure. Uh, the canon ends with what we call the, the great doxology, the great, uh, the, the minor elevation, which is when the priest elevates the chalice slightly from the, from the altar. Uh, oftentimes a bell will even be rung at that moment. Uh, and it's the, in Latin, say, they say, per ipsum et cum ipso, et in ipso, it continues. But in English, it's through him, with him and in him. Be to thee, God the Father Almighty, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory. So you can see that we're praying through, with, and in Jesus Christ, the second person, and we're directing this to God the Father in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and all glory. Of course, the Roman canon is that central aspect, the most important prayer of the Mass, because it's by the Roman canon that the bread and the wine are transubstantiated into the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and how this perfect sacrifice that renders the only fitting honor and glory to God is offered. Right in the Mass, again, very briefly, Jesus Christ in his is offering his sacred humanity to God the Father. Uh, so really, our Lord is the central actor, the central person doing the liturgy, offering the Holy Sacrifice of Mass. Of course, he works through his priest, but he is the principal person, and he's offering his sacred humanity. And in the Roman canon, that's where his sacrifice is being made present. We could say that that is what is giving uh, validity to the, the sacrifice, because that's where we get the matter and the form that change the, that, that make it a sacrifice by changing the bread and uh, the bread and wine into his body and blood. Okay, um, one, one last prayer that I'll really look at just a little closer from the liturgy for this Trinitarian structure is the preface to the Most Holy Trinity, and that comes right before the Roman canon. 
uh, right before the Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. It's basically where the Roman canon is going to begin, right? The three bells are rung and we all kneel and the Roman canon goes up to that uh, minor elevation and right after the minor elevation comes the Our Father. On most Sundays, for example, in the Sundays after Pentecost, various other feasts, unless we're in a, let's say, special season like you know, Lent to Christmas, the preface that is used right before that Sanctus is called the preface of the Most Holy Trinity. I do encourage you to get your missal and, and pray this. Uh, we'll do that right now. I'll read it to you so that you can see its contents, see what it says. It begins, Vere dignum et justum est. It is truly meet and just, right and for our salvation, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to Thee, Holy Lord, Father Almighty, Eternal God, who together with Thine only begotten Son and the Holy Ghost art one God, one Lord, not in the oneness of a single person, but in the Trinity of one substance. For what by thy revelation we believe of thy glory, the same do we believe of thy Son, the same of the Holy Ghost, without difference or separation. So that in confessing the true and eternal Godhead, in it we should adore distinction in persons, unity in essence, and equality in majesty, in praise of which angels and archangels, cherubim also and seraphim, day by day exclaim, without end and with one voice, saying, Sanctus, 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 and then begins that Holy Roman Canon. So you can see here from this prayer, it's actually quite similar to that doctrine we saw in the Creed of the Athanasian Creed. This expresses our faith and our belief in the Blessed Trinity. In fact, as a side note, I'll simply mention uh, it sometimes is, I think, a little frustrating to me to hear people say that the liturgy can be altered because it is merely disciplinary. It seems that when they say that, they forget this principle, lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, yes, there are certain elements to the liturgy that are disciplinary, but as a whole, the liturgy is the main way of sacred tradition in transmitting our doctrine. And if we begin to change the liturgy, for example, the prayers in the liturgy, then we're also going to affect the dogma of the faith, the only faith that saves the Catholic religion. So that's very problematic. There is a great doctrinal element as well to the liturgy. In fact, it's sort of sad you would realize that this great prayer of adoration and praise to the Trinity, this preface that we just prayed, is completely omitted from the sacred liturgy and never prayed, or if it's altered, weakened, diluted, that will then alter, weaken, dilute our faith in the Blessed Trinity. So let's get to some of these practical elements of our life. I would say the main thing is that not only is the liturgy teaching us our doctrine, but the liturgy is meant to shape us and form us. For example, the liturgy is meant to teach us how to pray. How do you pray to God? Do you pray to the triune God? Do you bring in some of these elements of the liturgy? For example, offering a prayer to the Father through the Son in the unity and the love of the Holy Ghost. We should be incorporating that into our own personal and private prayer. And by assisting at the liturgy, the liturgy will shape us and form us that way so that our prayer begins to change and shape us. One of the greatest things I ever heard about prayer that helped me a lot was I was told, look, you don't just, you don't pray to change God, like to change his mind. You pray to change yourself. In other words, too often I think people pray so that they want to have their will, and they want God to come and to conform to their will, right? Dear Lord, give me this or grant me that or I need this, uh, a lot of supplication. Whereas our prayer should really say, I'm going to change myself and my will so that I can begin to conform myself to God. Not my will, but thy will, as our Lord prayed in the agony of the gardeners. We always pray in the Our Father, thy will be done on earth, starting with me and my life, as it is up in heaven by all the great saints and angels. Uh, so prayer needs to change us. And in order for that to happen, we can't just pray just from within ourselves. 
because from within ourselves, it's not going to be that easy to change, but something external, something revealed by God, the power and the grace of God, which is external to us, coming to us through the liturgy, through the sacraments, His grace, that can then begin to transform us. So have the liturgy shape your prayer, form your prayer, teach you how to pray. Use some of the prayers from the liturgy in your own prayer. So I help sometimes to have a missal and to go over those things. Uh, you will see that the grace of God will be at work in your life. You'll see that the liturgy, for example, has four main types of prayer. We praise and honor God, this prayer of adoration. How much time do we spend just adoring God for His greatness, for His glory, for who He is? And then there's thanksgiving. We need to spend a lot of time expressing our gratitude to God, thanking Him for everything that He has done for us. So not just who He is in and of Himself and His great glory, but then how He takes care of us. Right? His divine providence watching over us. And then also supplication. We do ask him for the things that we need. As a good father, he wants us to ask those things. And then also uh, asking for forgiveness or atonement or reparation for our sins and the sins of others. All of those elements of prayer, those four main types of prayer, are in the liturgy. And we should try to incorporate them, incorporate them into our prayer life with this Trinitarian dimension. So, for example, if we're praying to God the Father, we might focus more on His role as the Creator. We might focus more on His divine providence, knowing that every moment of our life has already been seen by Him, that He's watching out for us. And no matter what evil things we might suffer in our own lives, in the world, in society, in our country at large, that God's got that in His hands and He's watching out for us and He is going to bring good out of it. He's going to have that opportunity if we but open our eyes in faith to see that. Uh, the divine will of God. Many of these are ways that we can direct our prayer to the Father. And then to the Son, I think that's a little easier because we're so familiar with Him since He uh, took on flesh and became man. Uh, but, for example, focusing on the devotions of the Sacred Heart or the Precious Blood, uh, His Passion, uh, certainly the Gospel narratives, even the Most Holy Eucharist, the Blessed Sacrament, Adoration. There, our prayer can be very focused to the Son. And then there's the Holy Ghost. We have to focus a lot on Him because He is that power of God, the life and the love and the unity that gives uh, strength to Catholic action, right? To do the spiritual and corporal works of mercy, to grow in all the different virtues, to grow in the gifts of the Holy Ghost. We need to know the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost and be asking for them, understand them, so that we can ask the Holy Ghost to give them to us and to strengthen them and to strengthen those gifts in us. Uh, you might be thinking, wow, that's a lot. Well, again, use the liturgy to help you. That's the point here, the lex orandi, the lex credendi. We could even add lex vivendi, to live according to the liturgy, that our law of life would conform ourselves to our doctrine and to our manner of worship. And then there are other sources. I highly encourage you to get a book, for example, like the Rakolta. The Rakolta is a collect, it's a book that has a collection of all the indulgence prayers of the church, you know, across centuries of tradition. As the popes would indulgence a prayer, it would get put into the Recolta. So the Recolta is like this great prayer book of the church. And it too, you'll see, has a section on prayers to God the Father, and then God the Son, and then God the Holy Ghost, and then also the Blessed Mother and the saints and prayers for the dead. But it has those first three sections uh, in its book are to the triune God, as well as the divine office which largely consists of the Psalms. You can pray those, and you'll see a Trinitarian structure therein as well. Perhaps not quite as clearly since they're coming from the Old Testament when the full revelation of the Blessed Trinity was still um, somewhat veiled, uh, but you can still perceive that, especially with a Catholic Christian faith. And if you pray the Divine Office, then you do have very, very powerfully a tremendous Trinitarian structure. The Divine Office is, after all, part of the liturgy. Uh, when you pray the Holy Rosary, also there, you can have that Trinitarian dimension. Uh, and through a number of prayers, especially from the wisdom of the saints, uh, they often prayed in this manner. It's really important, I think, to pray in this manner because otherwise we do have to ask ourselves, well, who are you praying to, if not to the Trinitarian God? Remember what the Athanasian Creed said, that one line where it said, so that in all things, as has been said above, the unity is to be worshipped in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity. He, therefore, who wishes to be saved must believe thus about the Trinity. You have to believe thus about God to be saved. And if you believe this, then it's going to affect the way you pray and certainly the way you live. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next episode, how we sort of live this mystery of the Trinity. 
Uh, but again, prayer is very important because it's not enough just to say, well, I believe in one God and I pray to one God. Because not everyone who believes in just one God is going to be praying to the same God. Obviously, I mean, we can look, uh, I know the, the Greeks and the pagans, they had more than one God, many of them. But for example, the Greeks, for them, Zeus was the supreme deity. So if there was a Greek running around who thought that Zeus was the only God because he's, let's say, the supreme deity and he was praying to Zeus, He's not praying to the true God. He certainly isn't in their other cultures. So, for example, uh, the Australian Aborigines believed in Bayam, a supreme deity. Uh, interestingly, he had a kind of consort, uh, as well as the Incas. I mean, the Incas believed in a single supreme deity, Itzamana, uh, but he also has a consort. Uh, the many Native Americans believed in the Great Spirit. So you can have all these beliefs in just one God. Believing in just one God does not mean we are praying to the same God because as the Athanasian Creed says, we have to worship the unity and Trinity and the Trinity and unity. That's who God is. God is a Trinity. This is a little extreme, but I'll mention it anyway, just so that you can sort of see the point here. Um, and there might be some people out there who do this. Say you believed in only quote unquote one God, but he was Belzebub. And so you gave yourself over to a kind of satanic worship because you think there's only one supreme deity, but he's the devil. Well, clearly, you are not worshiping the one true God. Uh, you have to worship the Trinity. You must worship God the Father. You must worship God the Son. That's why it's so important, for example, that we worship and we adore the Blessed Sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, because that is his body, blood, soul, and divinity, his real person is there in the Blessed Sacrament. One who does not worship the Holy Eucharist is not going to be worshiping the triune God and therefore is not worshiping the real God. And it's some other false God. It's some God he has created, but it's not the one true God. Remember, God is a trinity, and we must worship him thus. Our salvation does depend on this. Next week, we'll go ahead and look at this mystery of the trinity in our own lives. Does man reflect this image of the trinity? How so? What does that mean for how we live? Very important principles. I would ask you to email me any questions that you might have. Uh, we'll put the email up on the screen, info at fatima.org or my own. You can also call us at the number 1-800-263-8160. Please also do continue to pray for the Fatima Center. And thank you very much for your prayers and your support, uh, your generous donations that keep this apostolate working. I was very heartened because just recently I received some emails from a lady who lives down under in Australia. And she talks about how she can't find good catechesis and she can't find uh, a solid, reverent mass. And so she looks to the Fatima Center, these classes, she's very grateful for them so that she has a way to learn her faith and to deepen her faith. So these are the kinds of people in Australia, in the Philippines, and other places throughout the world that your donations are helping this apostolate reach to bring the message of faith of Our Lady Fatima and the Catholic truths which save. Thank you very much for your generous support. Please do continue to do so as God may move your heart. We'll go ahead and simply close with the glory be, and we'll do that also in Latin. Nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritus Sancto. Sicut erat in principio et nunc et semper et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. And you have a most blessed week.